Hi, I'm Ian Porlupi and welcome back to the Northland Workshop. Today we're going to do a project that is kind of unusual for me, and that is this birdhouse. Now the birdhouse itself is not unusual, it's just a standard birdhouse. This one I happen to build for wrens because I have a bunch of wrens around here. But besides that, it's just a normal birdhouse. What's unusual about it is we're using all hand tools. And not only are we using hand tools, I've limited it to hand tools that most homeowners will have. Or if you don't have all the tools, they're easy to find and inexpensive at either secondhand shops, yard sales, flea markets. Or if you have to buy a couple of them new, any hardware store should have these tools in stock. So this is a very good beginner project, especially if you have kids who want to build it with you because hand tools are great for kids. If you want to build this birdhouse, I will include a PDF in the description box of this set of plans that I drew for this very birdhouse. So if you want to build it along with the video, feel free to do so. I'm using 1x6 pine to make this birdhouse. It's pretty forgiving what type of wood you use. Different woods like cedar will last longer outdoors, but I happen to have a bunch of pine kicking around, so that's what I'm using. Now this house is sized so that way you can make it out of a 1x6. And just so you're aware, when the lumberyard calls it a 1x6, what you're getting is not actually 1 inch by 6 inches. It's actually 3 quarters of an inch thick and 5 and a half inches wide. So just be aware of that. The other thing we want to be aware of is the end of the board might not be 90 degrees to the edge. And if I take the first tool of the day, this is a combination square. It has a movable head that slides back and forth on the blade of the square, it has a track here that it locks into, and it makes a 90 degrees on this side, and then a 45 degree angle on that side. So if you have only one square, I would suggest it being a combination square. And you can get these at secondhand shops or hardware stores. What I want to do is lock it in place. Now the length doesn't really matter as long as it's locked in place. If it's not locked in place there's a chance it might not actually be at 90 degrees to the blade. So I want to lock it in place and hold it up against the end. Now I don't know if you can see it but there's about a sixteenth of an inch gap down here but it's touching up here. What that tells me is the end of this board is not square. So if I was to use it like that, I could have an issue. What I want to do is trim it off so that it is square. Now I want to move it in about a quarter of an inch because if I try to cut too close to the edge, the saw is just going to fall off. Once I have it, as long as I hold it tight to that face, I can go ahead and mark the line. The other thing I want to do is come over here, line up the pencil line like before, and mark 90 degrees right there. And that's going to help me when it comes time to sawing. We're ready to make our first cut in the project, and to do that we need a saw. So we need to talk about the saw real quickly. This is just a cheap hardware store saw. And this is probably the one tool I would recommend you don't buy used. The reason you don't want to buy it used is unless you want to get all set up to sharpen saws, it's best to just buy one brand new because then you know it's sharp out of the box. You'll hear terms like rip saw and crosscut saw. That depends on how the teeth are ground in order to make a cleaner cut across the grain or with the grain. For this, it really doesn't matter what it is as long as it's sharp. The other thing we're going to need is some way to hold this piece of wood. Now, if this table was lower, 
I could actually kneel on the board and cut it that way. However, it's not low enough for that. So, I'm going to use a clamp. Now, these are wooden hand screw clamps. You can get these things super cheap at yard sales or flea markets, stuff like that. And they don't cost that much if you have to buy them brand new. But if you look around a little bit, you can get some pretty good deals on these things. Why? Because a lot of people get frustrated by these things, and they are kind of finicky to use because the jaws get out of parallel very easily. The easiest way to open them or close them is to take one handle in each hand and simply spin it like that. That'll keep the jaws parallel. If they get way out of whack, the easiest thing to do is simply tighten them up again, get them so that they're parallel once again, and then go ahead and open them up. In this case, I need to open them up enough to clamp the piece of wood to the workbench. There. Now I can go ahead and start cutting. I want to grip the handle with three fingers with my index finger pointing along the top of the saw. That's going to give me much better control with pointing the saw and keeping it tracking in the correct direction versus holding it just like this because now it kind of wants to slide side to side. Next thing I want to do is figure out how to start the saw on the cut line. If I just try to mush the saw forward a lot of times it'll either just rip that front edge right off or it'll skip along and chew up the front edge. So there's a couple ways I can do this. I can either, with very, very light pressure, just the weight of the saw pushing down, I'm not pushing down on it, I'm just pulling back. You'll also see that my thumbnail is up against the plate of the saw. You want to be careful of the teeth because they are very sharp, but as long as I'm not under the saw, I'm beside the saw, I can use my thumb as a guide. Now if that's not working for you, the other thing you can do is to take a knife and right on the line just cut down a little bit at the corner and then come in on the waist side. So this is the side I want to keep, this is the side I don't care about. So I come in on the waist side and just cut down to that knife line a little bit. That'll make a little V-cut right there that'll help the saw blade get started. Once you get used to the saw, you probably won't have to do that each time, but it's a good way to start out. You'll notice, once again, that I mark the line going down at 90 degrees, and I have the line this way at 90 degrees. First thing I want to do when I get the saw started is watch and make sure that I go down 90 degrees that way. If sawdust builds up and I can't see the line, I simply remove it. There. Now that I have that lined up that way, I can start sawing and dropping the back of the saw as I go until I get to about 30 degrees is where I like to saw at. So I keep dropping, keep dropping. I'm watching the edge of the blade right on the pencil line. I want to keep tracking that pencil line. The key here is to not have a death grip on the saw because if you really bear down on the saw handle, you can actually twist it one way or the other. The nice thing is, once you establish this 90 degree cut right here, that will help hold the saw 90 degrees this way, so it won't angle this way or that way as long as you don't force it. If you twist it, you can override this cut, but as long as you let the saw do it, it wants to cut in a straight line. So all I have to do is focus on following this pencil line all the way back. 
as I near the end of the cut, because this is a short board, I can't really hold out here without the saw hitting me, so I'm going to stand it up just a little bit. And I'm supporting the waist with my left hand so it doesn't drop off. Very lightly at the end. There. If we look at this, that saw is not the cleanest cutting saw in the world, and I'm not the best hand saw in the world. So between those two things, these edges leave a bit to be desired. Now this is a birdhouse, and the birds don't really care. We could just go with it as is, or we can introduce another tool to help clean it up a little bit. Again, this is totally optional if you're okay with the edges being like this, I guarantee you the birds aren't going to mind one little bit. But for the sake of education, we're going to take it a step farther. So the next tool we're going to take a look at is a bench plane. Now this happens to be an old number three bench plane, and the numbering system just says what size it is. So this happens to be a fairly small bench plane, but it's the perfect size for making birdhouses. And these things can be had very, very cheaply at yard sales and flea markets, or if you want to spend more money on it, you can buy one off eBay. You can also buy some brand new bench planes from hardware stores or even Amazon, but be warned, you're going to have to do just about as much work to a brand new bench plane as you will to an antique bench plane that you find much, much cheaper. But once you have it fixed up, this is a great tool to have, and if you're going to do any amount of woodworking, you're going to want a bench plane. Now, the issue is, how do I hold this little piece of wood to plane it with the bench plane? This is not going to work real well. So, what I'm going to do is turn to the trusty wooden hand screw once again and grab a second one. I don't have a vise on this end of the workbench, and if you don't have a vise either, that's not a problem. As long as you have two of these hand screws, we can make a vise. What I want to do when I clamp this one hand screw to the other is make sure this face is flush with the edge of the workbench. And once I know it is, I will clamp it down as tightly as I can. This is now my makeshift vise. It's not quite as convenient as a regular woodworking vise, but it is much cheaper and much more portable. I'll get this tightened up so that it is close to where it needs to be. Now I can put my workpiece in. And I can go ahead and plane it. I've got it set for a very light cut, and the reason I have it set for a light cut is I don't want to shave this down too much, I just want to clean up any irregularity left by the saw. Plus, the finer the cut, the easier it'll be to deal with this little knot right here. The thing we want to practice is having the toe of the plane flat on the workpiece to start, push through, and then end with the heel of the plane flat on the workpiece. That way we aren't rounding it off as we start and stop. The other thing I can do if the grain seems to be fighting me is simply angle the plane and push it through. So I'm still pushing it straight along the edge, it's just at an angle now, so it makes more of a slicing cut. And once I clean up the saw marks, I'm happy with that. And we get all these little shavings. Now I can turn my attention to the end grain of the board. And a bench plane like this works great for end grain as well, as long as we do a couple things. 
One, we want to make sure it's a very light cut. We don't want it to dig in and start tearing. The other thing is we don't want to push the blade all the way past the end because it could break off these fibers right here. So I'm going to plane about to the three quarter inch mark. I'll flip it around and plane the other way. So that way I'm never taking the blade all the way off the far end. If it starts twisting in our makeshift vise like that, that just means the vise jaws aren't quite parallel. And I'll just adjust them a little bit. There. Now what I want to do is stop and grab the square and check to make sure that I'm not tipping it one way or the other. To do that, just take it out and eyeball it. And that is looking good. I'll check from this side too. That looks pretty good. I'm just a little high over here, which makes sense because I haven't planed that part yet. So I'll flip it around and plane this edge. There. Bottom has been planed nice and smooth and square on all four sides. So we're ready for the last operation for the bottom. And if we look on the blueprint, we can see that I've put four quarter inch diameter drainage holes in it. And that's important so any water that might get in through the opening has a way to get out so the nest doesn't get soggy. So we need a way to drill it. Most people are going to have a cordless drill kicking around. However, if you don't have a cordless drill kicking around, you can always go with the tried and true brace. Here's the brace, and here's the bit we're going to be using. It takes an auger bit that has this square tapered end, and that fits into special jaws at the end of the brace. And we tighten it down, and that makes a very firm connection. Now, the bit is special not only because of the square end, but because of the cutting end. It has this little screw point on it, commonly referred to as a snail. Then it has these two little wings that stick out. Those are the knickers that help make a clean hole. And then it has the great big auger thread to help clean all the wood chips out of the hole. I put the bottom back in the makeshift vise and I want to drill the two top holes then I'll flip it and drill the other holes. And to do this what I want to do is pick a point I'm going about a half inch down and a half inch in from the corner and the knob of the brace I want to hold or I can push against it with my body and slowly start turning it. The snail will pull the bit into the workpiece and as you can see the auger thread pulls all the wood out. What I want to do is stop every now and then and look at the back. Now the snail is just poked through so I'm going to wind it backwards to unscrew it and I'm going to move on to the next hole. The reason for that is if I drill all the way through from one side it's going to blow out the end by flipping it around, putting the snail back in the hole that it just formed, and finishing the big hole from this side, I'm left with a clean hole on both sides of the bottom. And I'll just repeat that process for the other three drainage holes. I'm ripping one of the two roof pieces and I find a lot of times it's easier to clamp it in this makeshift vise and rip it going down than it is to rip it on the flat clamp to the workbench. Now when I get down near the end to avoid cutting into the workbench what I'm going to do is actually unclamp it and then put it in at an angle like this. Now that's okay because 
I now have the full blade of the saw in the saw cut, so that's going to guide it in a straight line. So as long as I don't do something weird, like twist the thing, it'll continue cutting in that straight line for the rest of the rip. And again, you can leave that edge, or if you have a plane, you can go ahead and plane it smooth. Either way, the birds don't care, and it's your birdhouse, so you make it however you want. I'm ready to attempt the trickiest cut on the birdhouse, and that is to make the peak for the roof on the front and the back of the birdhouse. So I've clamped them together, I planed the bottoms smooth and square, the tops are a little bit different, but that's okay because it's about to get trimmed off. And now I've laid out for the peak on the front, and I've made a line all the way across. But to help me in this endeavor, I'm going to go ahead and just score this with my knife a couple times. That's going to help the saw get started. Now if you have a chisel, I would go ahead and just pare down ever so slightly to that knife wall right there. And then you can flick that out of the way. That gives you a very definitive start. Now if you don't have a chisel, you can go ahead and carefully with your knife just cut down ever so slightly and that does the exact same thing it's just a little more difficult now I can go ahead and start the saw in that little recess and it'll make it a whole lot easier because it's going to try and skid on me since I'm cutting at a 45 degree angle here There's one half. Now without removing them from the makeshift vise, I can go ahead and plane these things down to the line and smooth them up a little bit. Now I need to drill the hole to let the birds in and out of the house. And to do that, I'm going to use this expansion bit. And the way this thing works, it's like an adjustable wrench. I loosen up this screw right here, just a little bit, and then there's this other screw in here that when I turn it, moves the cutter in and out at a very controlled rate. In this case, I need to wind it in until it's at the inch and an eighth mark because that's what these wrens need for their door. And depending on the type of birds you're going to have in your birdhouse, that will 
determine the size opening they need. If you go too big of an opening, bigger birds will take over. And if you don't go big enough, then the bird you want to go in won't be able to fit. Now I want to tighten it down so it doesn't move as I drill. And I can go ahead and put it in the brace just like before. I've marked a line five inches up from the bottom of the birdhouse. And again, that distance is dictated by the type of bird you're building the house for. And then what I did is I marked in from one edge to the center and I marked from the other. And as you can see, there's a little discrepancy there. And that's not a problem because that discrepancy is where the actual center is. And so I'll put the snail right there and I'll push and I'll start drilling. And just like before, I'll stop just as the snail pokes through the other side. Unclamp this, spin it around, and finish it from this side. Now, sometimes that happens. The rest of it breaks out before that little piece does. That's not a big deal. Usually you can just break it out by hand. If there's a burr inside, like there is on this one, what I'll do is just take a small chisel and clean it out. If you don't have a small chisel, all you need is a piece of sandpaper and that'll come right out of there. There's one thing I need to check before I start assembly, and that's the height of the side. If I put this flush with the bottom, I see it comes right up to the very bottom of the slope of the roof. I want this to be down an eighth of an inch because that eighth inch gap all the way along on both sides is going to allow for ventilation for the birds. So in the plans, I have it sized so that way if you cut it to the right size, everything will line up and you'll have the eighth inch gap at the top. However, apparently as I was building this thing, things shifted a little bit. Maybe I planed a little too much off the bottom here. Maybe I didn't plane enough off the side. Who knows? But regardless, I need to trim this side down by an eighth of an inch to allow for ventilation. I'm going to check the other side too while I'm at it. And that one is the same way. So both of these need to be trimmed down. The easiest way to do that is with the plane. I'll clamp these in the makeshift vise, plane an eighth of an inch off. If you don't have a plane, what you can do is mark a line and simply cut it with the saw. It's a little tricky to cut it with the saw that close to the edge, but I think you can do it if you take your time. In my case, it's time for the plane. Now it's time to start assembling the birdhouse. And the first thing I want to do is unclamp this makeshift vise. Just move these out of the way for a second and sweep off this little pile of sawdust. I want to make sure to sweep it off and not brush it because that's a really good way to end up with a handful of slivers. With that cleaned off, I'm going to go ahead and bring back the makeshift vise, except now, instead of lining the jaw up with the edge of the workbench, I'm putting it right on the workbench. And you're going to see in just a second what that's going to help me with. The first thing I want to do for assembly is to put the two pieces of the roof together. And if you notice, one piece of the roof is three quarters of an inch wider than the other piece. The reason for that is if I have the same exact size and I overlap it, one side would then be three quarters of an inch longer than the other. By making this one three quarters of an inch smaller than the other, when I put them together like this, it ends up being the same distance. The other thing I want to look at 
is if these things are cupped at all. And you can see this one's cupped in a little bit. And if I look at this one, this one's cupped in a little bit. I want the cup to go down. If I have it the other way and the cup is going up, if that cup gets worse, it's going to pull away from the birdhouse. This way, it naturally wants to cup down more. Not a big deal if it cups away from the birdhouse a little bit, but if I have a choice, I would rather have it curl down. See, now with these clamps over the workbench, I have a solid bearing point under it. So I put the small piece on the bottom, and now I can go ahead and nail the top piece to the bottom. And for nails, I'm using these inch and a half common nails. The reason I'm using inch and a half is this is three quarter inch thick wood, and I want an equal amount of nail to be in this piece and the other piece. These are not galvanized, so they will rust over time, but that's okay. The wood will rot out long before these nails do. Want to make sure the top is even, and I can go ahead and nail. Now, if you're having trouble holding this thing in place while you're nailing, what I would recommend is grabbing a scrap piece of wood and going ahead and starting the nails on the scrap piece of wood. Now what you can do is keep tapping them in until the point just barely peeks out on them. What that'll do is keep it from sliding. Now what I'll do is I'll line up the two edges in the top part. and I can go ahead and nail it together. There, the roof is together. Now we want to put the bottom and nail it to one of the sides. Again, I'm going to look at the sides and see which one is the straighter of the two. That's this one, so I'm going to set that aside for the time being. The more warped one is going to go ahead and go right here. And I can do the same thing with the nails in this case. The biggest thing here is you just want to set the nails in far enough that they don't poke through the drainage holes. It's not the end of the world if they do, but it's better if they don't. Now I can go ahead and nail the front on.
This side is a little bit different because we need to be able to open up the birdhouse to remove the remains of the old nest in between each season. So in order to do that, this needs to be hinged. What I'm going to do is measure up, uh, let's call it four and a quarter. So we have four and a quarter right there. I'm going to flip it over to the front and measure up four and a quarter as well. And this will be where we put the nails. Now I need the nails to be in line, so I'm going to take my combination square, and because this is three quarter inch thick wood, I'm going to set this to be three eighths of an inch and I'm going to draw a line right there. I'll flip it over before I change anything and draw a line right there. And if I connect the two, that's where I need to put a nail and right here is where I need to put a nail. So I'll make sure the side is in place, that it's flush with the bottom. It's exactly how I want it to be. And I can go ahead and put the nail in. And if I flip it around, I'll put the nail in the back side. And let's see how it does. It's a little stiff but I think it'll be okay. I'd rather have it a little tight than too loose. I want to put one screw in the bottom right here so that way the door doesn't open accidentally when the birds are actually in this thing. So I could probably just drive the screw in with a screwdriver and it would be okay because this is just pine. However, I really don't want to split it after putting this much work into it. So I'm going to use this old egg beater style drill. Again, if you have a cordless drill, this is a perfect opportunity to use the cordless drill. But if you don't, these things are about $2 at a yard sale. hold it in place until it's time to clean out the old nest. Now I can go ahead and put the roof on. Now if you're trying to hammer in these nails and you're seeing that the birdhouse is scooting all around, you can always take the trusty clamps and clamp them to the side of the workbench. What this will do is provide me with a stop so the thing's not trying to scoop quite as much. The other thing you can always do if you're having trouble nailing the roof on is pre-drill with the egg beater drill and I just use a drill bit that's slightly smaller than the nail and really I only want to go through this first board a little bit I don't want to drill all the way in because I want the nail to hold in this board
The nice thing about pre-drilling it is it makes it a lot easier to start the nail. The front nails can be kind of tricky because if I get in the wrong spot, they're going to be sticking down into the birdhouse and the birds might get hurt. If I put them too far forward, they're going to stick through the front and it's going to be unsightly. So the easiest thing I know to do in this case is to take my combination square, butt it up against the front of the birdhouse and actually slide it up to it. That shows me where the front edge of this piece is. So if I draw a line right there, that's the front edge. I need to be right about here, about three eighths of an inch in. With that in mind, I can go ahead and drill some holes to start the nails. house is done.